If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. We are walking through the book of Romans, verse by verse and line by line. And I hope you have enjoyed our study as much as I've enjoyed uh, preparing it. Today I want to talk to you about God's mercy. Folks, I am telling you, there's two things that I think of uh, when I think of God's mercy. Uh, Number one is God's forgiveness. Okay, He forgives us. And the other thing is God's grace. Uh, We don't deserve it, folks. We don't deserve uh, His mercy and His grace. But He uh, extends that to us and He loves us very, very much. If you have a bulletin and want to follow uh, in, in the bulletin with us, there's an outline there, and you might want to jot down some notes. Uh, God's mercy, number one, Israel questioning God. Israel questioning God. And again, we are talking about Israel as a nation, but we are talking about the Jewish leaders uh, specifically here. Number two, Israel's unbelief. Israel's unbelief. You would think with the history that they had, with the uh, you know, going through all that they did and seeing the miracles. Uh, I can't imagine uh, being, you know, at the Red Sea and seeing uh, what Moses did and seeing the water part and then not believe in God. Matter of fact, I don't understand people today that don't believe in God because he's everywhere, folks. Just go look at a sunset. Go look at a sunrise. Go up on top of a mountain and look across that. You can see God everywhere. So we see Israel questioning God, Israel's unbelief, and Israel's stumbling block. Israel's stumbling block. Folks, there are people that don't want to see it. They don't want to hear about God. They don't want to know what he did for them. They don't think God has anything to do with their life. And I got news for you folks. God's got everything to do with your life. He is sovereign. He is almighty. He is king of the universe. He is Lord of lords. And folks, he's coming back now. He is coming back for his church, and we praise God for that. You know, there are people in life that truly struggle with the sovereignty of God. And again, when we talk about the sovereignty of God, folks, it's, he is all-knowing. He is in control. He knows everything. They believe that God is wise, all-knowing, righteous, and just, but they do not understand how God allows some people uh, to be saved and go to heaven while others are lost and bound for hell. Let me be clear about this because it says so in the Word of God. 2 Peter 3.9 Peter 3, nine says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Folks, if God promises something, he's going to do it. It's going to take place, as some count slackness. But he is long-suffering towards us. Aren't you glad we serve a patient God? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Folks, I'm telling you today, God wants you saved. He has given you opportunity to be saved. And the bottom line is this, God wants everyone saved, But he doesn't make people come to Christ. He gives everyone the freedom of choice. In our text today, Paul explains, it is God's mercy and grace that allows us to be saved. We are all sinners. We all deserve to be punished for our sin. But God gives us the choice to accept him or to reject him. Let's continue to learn from God's holy word as we study the holy scriptures today. God's mercy. Romans 9, and we're going to start in verse 19. And we do remember verse 18. Therefore he has mercy on those who he wills, and and whom he wills he hardens. And folks, again, it goes back to predestination. It goes back to the sovereignty of God. God knows. God gives everyone a chance. We just spoke about Moses and Pharaoh. And we spoke about how they had a lot of the same beginning. And folks, Pharaoh had every chance in the world to be saved. He sent God's messenger Moses. He saw the miracles that that he performed. Uh, God allowed him to perform, but yet he still denied Jesus Christ. He did not accept Jesus as his Savior. And folks, that was his personal choice. So we see in verse 19, 
You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? I got news for you. Every one of us has resisted God's will. You don't always do what God asks you to do. And even in my case, God called me to salvation three times. Three times he called me, and I didn't answer to the last call. Folks, he, if he called me one time, he would have been a fair and just God. But he had mercy on my life. Verse 20, but indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Folks, we do have a choice. God shows uh, you know, everyone, God uh, proves to everyone that it is real, that God is real and God is in control. God sends that mercy and that grace out to everyone, but not all choose to have that. And the, the, the leaders uh, that Paul, that were debating Paul was just saying, you know, how can a God do this? How can a guy send someone to hell? And folks, he's never sent anyone to hell. He gives us the choice. Hold your finger there and go to Isaiah with me. Isaiah. Paul is going to use the Old Testament. And, and folks, Paul was sharp because these guys knew the Old Testament. They knew the law. They knew all about that. And so Paul used the Old Testament as a commentary on the New Testament and what he was trying to say. Look at Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the king of Israel. And folks, he is the king. He is the king. And his redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. I got news for you, folks. God was not created. God always was. And time is nothing to him. He does not get in our box. He does not get in time. He knows everything. He is sovereign. We can't even think like him most of the time. Besides me, there is no God. Notice the capital G. There are a bunch of little gods with little Gs. And the world is telling you to worship them. But there's only one true God, and that's Jehovah God of this Bible. And who can claim it as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people. And the things that are coming shall come. Let them show these to them. Do not fear and do not be afraid. Have I not told you that from time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. Oh, folks, the sovereignty of God is real. God is in control of everything. God uh, gives everyone a chance to be saved. God shows us his mercy every day of our lives. Then look in Isaiah 45. Just flip the page there. Isaiah 45, verse 18. For thus saith the Lord, who created the heavens? Folks, we know who did that. God did. He spoke it into existence. Who is God? Who formed the earth and made it? Who has established it? It was God. You are here because God put you here. God breathed life into you. You didn't have a choice where you're going to be born. You didn't have a choice of who you were going to be born to. That's all in God's hands. That's all the sovereignty of God. He has established it. Who did not create it in vain? Who formed it to be habited? Folks, you are here for a reason and you have a purpose in your life, and that very first purpose in your life is to find Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And until you uh, find him, you cannot really live life. And it says, I am the Lord, and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare Things are right. Folks, God has shown himself to everyone. And Paul, in his debate with these folks, were just trying to say, even in that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, 
Jesus Christ lived here and he is the Messiah and you would not even recognize that. And so we see as we move on, he says, who makes me like this? Does not the potter have the power back in verse 21 over the clay and the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? Folks, I am telling you, God created you. God created you. He made you just like he wanted you. He formed you. He formed you. He knows everything about you. The Bible says he knows the, even the number of hairs on your head. And that same God gives you opportunity to worship him. That same God shows himself in creation. That same God, every day of your life, if you think about your body, how many times you take a breath every day, how many times your heart beats every day. I got news for you folks. It's not the doctors that keep going, and they help, but I'm telling you, they are not God. They aren't. I heard, I heard a surgeon one time say this in Lawton, Oklahoma, life and death is in my hand. And it took every bit of my being. I was just a, a youth minister, 23 years old, not to say, oh, no, sir, that is not the truth. My life is in God's hand. It's God's hand. And God loves you. And God sends mercy out for you. And it says, uh, we are the clay, folks. God molds us and makes us into what uh, we are what we are. And the great thing about that is it doesn't matter about your beginning. Maybe some people didn't have a good start and have a good childhood or have a good life at first. But God can change every bit of that. God can change your heart. God can change your life if you will allow him to come into it. Look at verse 22. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, and not of the Jews only, but the Gentiles also. The thing that Paul was trying to get over to these Jewish leaders was, you are not the only one. You are God's chosen people. You are God's people. You are a holy nation. He chose you. But it, salvation is for the Gentiles also. And when you think about Paul's life, you talk about somebody extending mercy. You talk about Paul being grateful for what God done in his life. Folks, he... He was Saul. He was a Christian persecutor. His life was a train wreck. He went around and thrown people in prison. And he was running from God. He didn't care about the church. He didn't care about God. Then one day, on the road to Damascus, God struck him blind and spoke to him out loud and said, Paul, you are mine. Hold your finger there and go to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. And God had prepared a man, and his name was Ananias. And Ananias was to go to Paul, and at, or at that time it was Saul, and just tell him, man, God uh, has done this for a reason and a purpose. And look, starting in verse 13 there. He, he gave him a, a, a job to do, and Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. What was Ananias saying? God, are you sure? Are you sure you want me, you want me to go? Maybe do you have somebody else that will go for you? And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call upon your name. Folks, there's no happenstance. There's no accident. Folks, God prepared Ananias to speak the truth to Saul. And the Bible says in verse 15, here it is, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the kings and the children 
of Israel. What is a chosen vessel? Vessel? Folks, that's predestination. Saul was on his way to hell. Saul was a scribe and a Pharisee. Saul knew the law. He knew all these things that were going on, but he was not a believer. He didn't know Jesus Christ. But God showed him mercy. And Saul uh, uh, responded to the gospel. And just like the song said, he was saved. Look at verse 16. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Oh, listen to me, folks. The Bible tells us it is the mercy of God that lets us live. It is the mercy of God that is hovering over our lives. It is the mercy of God that allowed you to be saved. It is God's mercy that we operate in everything we do in life. And not just his mercies. You know what else he gives us? He blesses us. We are the blessed people of God. So we need to thank God for his mercy. We need to thank God for choosing us. We need to thank God knowing that we will spend an eternity with him. So we see Israel questioning God, but we can also see Israel's unbelief. Israel's unbelief. Look at verse 25 in our text. And here, again, Paul uses Hosea and he uses Isaiah. He uses two prophets these Jewish leaders would know. And Hosea is not as uh, you know, uh, well-known as Isaiah, but I'm telling you, Isaiah, other than Moses, was probably one of the most uh, respected uh, prophets of God. Look what he says. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called the sons of the living God. Well, who's he talking about? Folks, he's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews thought they, and they were God's people, but they did not think the Gentiles could be saved. They still told them you had to adhere, adhere to the law. You had to uh, do uh, you know, the law and follow the law and do what the law says. And God here is telling them, hey, listen, God's own people rejected him. The Israelites as a whole rejected him. So now I'm going to the Gentiles. And folks, he had already showed mercy on the Jews. But the Jews, I am telling you, they hated the Gentiles. They did. They, they would not, if they were on one side of the street and they came up to one, they would literally go to the other side so they would not have to make eye, eye contact or even touch a Gentile. They thought they were so holy. They thought they were so special. Even Jesus got on them for, for rejecting the Gentiles and rejecting uh, him Self is the Messiah. And it was. It was these Jewish leaders that crucified. I understand the Romans carried it out. But it was the Jews that crucified uh, Jesus Christ, our Savior. And that's what he is saying. He is simply saying, if the, the Israel as a whole will not accept me, then I'll go to people that will accept me. And, and salvation is for everyone. And look what it says in verse 27. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel uh, be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. And folks, I'm just telling you, there were over 2 million Jews in that days, and, and I don't know what the Jewish population is now, but there are a ton of them. And a lot of them are moving back to Israel and moving back but they still have not recognized Jesus for who he is. And he is saying a remnant is simply a small number. A small number of those will be saved because they reject Jesus Christ as their Savior. Then look in verse 28. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. What is the work? 
Folks, the work's the gospel. What is the work? Seeing people saved. He is doing that here. He is doing that all across our nation and all around the world. And when you think about cutting it short, what is our life compared to eternity? I mean, uh, the Bible tells us in the Old Testament, even 70 years is an extremely small amount of time compared to eternity. And folks, I believe with all my heart, we are living in the last days. The last days. The time is coming soon. It is coming soon. And it, and it says in verse 29, and, and as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of the Sabbath have left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom, and we would have been uh, made like Gomorrah. Folks, I am telling you, the only reason God hasn't come yet and sent Jesus yet, there are still people that need to be saved. And we as Christians, we need to be planting those seeds of the gospel. It was so good to hear Scott uh, tell me yesterday while they were out at Chaffee Crossing, two people came, two people visited with Scott, and he led them to the Lord right out there. And folks, that's what it's about. It's us being in the community. It's us telling our peers. It's us telling our work associates. It's us telling our families about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And even as I look back in this writing and you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, folks, is that not exactly where we're heading right now? The things we would have been ashamed of before they put it on TV. The things that we would not even dare mention when I was a kid, they are saying we need to be like this. Folks, there has never been a stronger time in the life of our church that we need to stand up for right, we need to stand up for the Word of God, and we need to tell people the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine... Now, I'm just thinking of uh, not just my kids. I'm thinking of my grandkids. What kind of world are they going to uh, end up living in? Oh, I know I'll be dead and gone, but they'll still be my flesh and my blood. And folks, we need to pray for our families. Families, We need to pray for people around us and our neighbors that they will understand the seed of the gospel and that they will come to Jesus Christ. Look at Romans chapter 3. Just go back to Romans chapter 3, if you would. Just a few chapters back. Romans chapter 3, verse 9. Romans 3, 9. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously uh, charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. Paul, in the early part of Romans, was sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, one of the things I still use to this day in leading someone to Christ is the Roman road. And you need to write the Roman road down. You need to get a Gideon Bible. It's in the Gideon Bible. You need to, be, you need to have that ready when someone asks you about being saved or someone asks you why you go to church or someone asks you, how can you be so happy? And you can share the Roman road with them. Verse 10, that is as written, there is none righteous, no, not one. It's the universal, universal human depravity. We all were born into sin. Hey, you don't have to tell a little a toddler. You don't have to, and man, we got one, okay? We got a three-year-old, and if you want to test your grandchildren, and Kylie, I love that girl. Man, she, she, I'm telling you, God's got something for that girl. But if you tell her, Kylie, don't do this, first thing she does is she looks around. And then if we turn our back, if we turn anything, man, there she is doing it. You don't have to teach a kid to be bad. And I'm not saying she's bad. I'm just saying she's young. 
okay? She is stubborn. Oh, my goodness. She got every one of Papa's stubborn genes, okay? That's what it's saying. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who seeks or who understands. There's none who seeks God. They have all turned aside. They have together uh, become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Folks, I'm telling you, before you found Christ, you were a sinner. You needed the mercy of God in your life. And I thank God that uh, we were chosen. He chose us. I thank God that He called us. I thank God that He has justified us. And I thank God that one day He will glorify us. But we all started the same. You were a sinner. And every man born of a woman is a sinner, according to Psalms 51.5. Now skip down to verse 21. Verse 21. But now, what does that mean? That means something's changed. We were born sinners, but you can change. Folks, I knew there was something wrong in my life. I was dumped when I was five years old because an evangelist come through and just said, hey, do you want to go to hell? I was five years old. And I didn't want to go to hell. It, I don't remember anything about that experience. And then I went to Falls Creek, which is the largest of the youth encampment. And on Friday night, I know God called me to salvation. And I went down and I prayed a prayer. And for about three or four weeks, because we went in July and school started in August, I did real good till I went back to school. And from my ninth grade year, which I would have been about 14 years old, to, to when I was 22 years old, I knew I wasn't truly born again. Why? Because the Holy Spirit told me, and I just ignored it for eight years. But when I was 22, something changed. Something changed. Folks, I could not change on my own. It was the Spirit of God that came inside of me and changed me. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Folks, the key is faith. You must believe Hebrews 11 6 tells us it says the righteous of God to through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe for there is no difference doesn't matter who you are doesn't matter where you were born doesn't matter the color of your skin doesn't matter what you have on doesn't matter what's going on or where you live or you know any any of that does not matter but look what verse 23 says for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Folks, I am telling you, you can't clean up enough, you can't read enough, you can't do enough good works to be saved. The Bible clearly says you must come by faith in Jesus Christ. It is so, so important. And then uh, the, the third thing I want you to share with you Israel questioning God, Israel's unbelief, and Israel's stumbling block. Israel's stumbling block. Look at verse 30. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained righteousness. See, the Jews thought, if I'm right enough, if I clean up enough, if I do the right thing, if I look right, then I'll be right. But folks, that's not true. Who have attained righteousness, even the righteousness of faith, but Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith. They had a works salvation. There's a deal about works, folks, that I've always wondered. How do you know when you've done enough? You want to work your way in? I promise you there's somebody better than you. I promise you there's people that have done more than you. It's not by works. Because they did not seek, but, but by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. Verse 33, as it is written, 
Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, who and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. You know what Israel was stumbling over? Jesus Christ as the Messiah. You ever be walking down a dirt road or walking on a hike somewhere and you're not really paying attention and you, you get your foot caught on a rock or a, a root of a tree and you just almost do a face plant right there? That's what a stumbling stone is. That's what a stumbling block is. Jesus Christ was in their midst. Jesus Christ showed himself to them. Jesus Christ performed miracles in front of them. Jesus Christ did all these things and told them how to be saved, but yet they kept saying, crucify him, crucify him. Folks, it was a stumbling block. And even today, folks, there are things that we stumble over. One of the things that we stumble over, well, I just don't think I can change. Well, I got news for you. You can't on your own. But if you come to Christ, if you give it all to Christ, you can change. Other things we stumble over is maybe we look at other people and say, well, they call themselves Christians. Folks, don't compare yourself to anyone. It's just going to be you and God up there. That judgment seat day is just you and God. If you want to compare yourself to somebody, compare yourself to Jesus Christ. And folks, we all come short of that. We're not getting there on, on what we do. We're not getting there on how good we are. We're getting there because of God's grace and because God's mercy. I know you know this, but Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, we still have to read this. Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith. What's grace? God's riches at Christ's expense. Jesus lived a perfect life. Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus died on a cross for our sins. Jesus was beaten and spit upon, and he uh, 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 took all the sins of the world on himself. He was the perfect sacrifice, the perfect Lamb of God, and they killed him. But yet, after three days, folks, our Jesus arose. He arose. And folks, it doesn't have to be Easter to get excited about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every day is Easter Sunday if you know him as your personal Lord and Savior. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. How plain can you get? It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And we don't have time to go there, but today sometime, look at Psalm 118, and it talks about Jesus in Isaiah. That was 700 years before Christ was born. He was called, uh, you know, the cornerstone, the cornerstone. And then the last scripture, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, 1 Corinthians 1, go with me. And we close with this, where is the wise, where's the scribe? Where's the disputer of their age? Folks, you can argue with God all day long, but you, you are not going to win that argument. You're not. Has, God, has not God made the foolish uh, the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. They even called uh, 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 you know, uh, the king called Paul. Paul, have you lost your mind? No, folks. He gave his heart to Jesus Christ. He was on fire for the gospel of Jesus Christ. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block. To the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God 
is stronger than men. Folks, God is faithful. God is just. God is merciful. God extends great graciousness to us. God extends righteousness to us. And if He made a promise, He will keep that promise. I ask you as we close today, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? I didn't ask you if you'd been baptized. I didn't ask you if you come to church. I didn't ask you if you put money in the plates. We are asking you the gospel, the word of God is asking you, are you saved? Do you know for sure that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven? Oh, folks, I got good news for you. If you can't say yes, God is waiting for you. We will be standing down front here. And my suggestion is that on that first note, that first note, you come down, you let us talk to you about being saved, and we will show you in Scripture how to do it. Father, thank you for the day, and God, I just thank you for just the Scripture that we read. I thank you for Paul, God, I thank you for his burden for lost people. And God, again, I just pray if there's one lost here that doesn't know you, God, I pray today would be their day of salvation. God, you can do it. Man, you're the miracle-working God. You can change a man from the inside out. So, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just work in our hearts. God, I pray for the Christian today. I pray that they would be busy sowing seeds of the gospel. God, I pray there could be some who need to follow you in baptism, just as Trey did. What a beautiful picture of starting new. Lord, others, Lord, may want to come and join our church. God, we give this time to you. We give this invitation to you today. And God, you do with it what you choose. You are sovereign. You are mighty. You are in control. So God, I pray that our people would respond only to you and to the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rahill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.